Manoj, you're muted. I'm learning, I guess. All right. Good morning and welcome to the Provost Fall Teaching Town Hall Forum. My name is Manoj Chopra, Interim Associate Dean for Academic Affairs for the College of Engineering and Computer Science, Professor of Civil Engineering and the NCAA Faculty Athletics Representative. Good morning, I'm Jennifer Sandoval, Associate Professor of Communication in the Nicholson School of Communication and Media and the Faculty Fellow for Inclusive Excellence. Together, we are your moderators today for a panel that includes Michael Johnson, Interim Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs, Michael Dykin, Associate Vice President of Student Health Services and Principal Medical Advisor for the University's response to the pandemic. Jana Jasinski, Professor of Sociology and Vice Provost for Faculty Excellence. Maureen Binder, Associate Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer. Tom Cavanaugh, Vice Provost for Digital Learning. Misty Shepard, Interim Vice President of Administration and Finance. And Dwayne Seaman, Assistant Vice President of Facilities and Safety Operations. Jen will now explain our format. Thanks, Manoj. And thank you everyone for joining us this morning. We know you have a lot going on and this has been a particularly difficult week in a lot of ways. To everyone listening and watching on Zoom, you'll want to note the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Please use that Q&A feature to ask questions so that Manoj and I can share them with the panelists. You can also designate who the question is for if it's not for Provost Johnson. You'll also note there's an upvote option. So if you see someone has already asked a question that you're really interested in, make sure to upvote it because we're gonna give preference to the upvoted questions followed by questions in order asked. There also might be a few more straightforward or granular questions and those might be passed over for the main discussion. But if you look in the Q&A session, you might find those in the answered tab if someone is able to direct you to more information about that. We're also simulcasting on UCF's YouTube channel. If any attendees are hearing from colleagues having trouble with Zoom, please direct them there. We won't be able to answer any questions from the YouTube channel itself, so make sure if you want to engage or on the Zoom call, the Zoom webinar. You can also find the direct YouTube link at events.ucf.edu. Interim Provost Johnson, would you like to give us a quick general outline of the planning considerations for fall teaching, and then we'll get to the questions. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Manoj, and welcome everyone to today's town hall. The time since spring break has been challenging. I deeply appreciate the thoughtful and creative and difficult work that our faculty and staff members have carried out to keep us operating and to support our students. And I know that this has been a very difficult time for many of you. Just as, it ha just as it has been for so many of our students. Illness and job loss and family responsibilities and anxiety have been hard. It is compassion for one another that is seeing us through. I'm grateful for this opportunity to briefly discuss the latest planning that's underway for fall, but especially to hear questions, concerns, and suggestions about our fall teaching from our faculty. We've been moving very rapidly to plan, but most plans are not yet complete and your ideas are needed. First and most important, we do not yet know what UCF will look like in the fall. As a result, we've been planning for different possible fall scenarios for teaching. Our plans prioritize the health of our campus community, providing a high quality education and remaining flexible so that we can respond to changing public health circumstances. We're following advice from federal, state, and local health professionals and guidance from the Florida Board of Governors. The planning has been carried out by a number of task forces and work groups, some of which have been operating since March and others established more recently, even today. Faculty members are engaged with these groups and a page with more information about them has been set up on UCF's coronavirus website. An inflection point in our planning is coming up fast. We will submit a plan for fall to our Board of Trustees on June 18th, and then to the Florida Board of Governors for approval 
on June 23rd. At its meeting yesterday, the Board of Governors formally unveiled its fall blueprint for state universities, guidelines that will inform our planning. The blueprint is not surprising. It covers matters such as health considerations, testing, tracing, and the need to be flexible in planning for fall. Let me repeat that our plans are not complete, including for teaching this fall. You'll hear this several times today. Plans are underway, not finished. We want your input. But in brief, here is where we are right now. We're planning for four potential fall scenarios on how we'll teach. Number one, fully remote. Number two, mostly remote, with only the most necessary face-to-face -face classes say senior design, pottery, clinical experiences, some labs, things like that. Number three, more face-to-face -face teaching with physical distancing. And number four, a normal semester. I, I won't say anything about the fourth scenario. I don't think it'll happen and it doesn't require any special planning. The biggest push in late spring and early summer was to make sure we would be ready for a potential fully remote fall the first scenario I mentioned. This took a lot of work from faculty and from programs, figuring out how to be prepared to offer quality instruction in challenging courses such as labs. And also it was a big effort by the staff and the Division of Digital Learning and the many faculty they're working with right now to be better prepared for this potential scenario. The second and third scenarios would have some classes on campus. The second would have nearly all classes remote. As I mentioned, colleges have worked with programs, program faculty, to identify the courses and programs most in need of on-campus instruction. The third scenario expands on this, seeking to have more classes on campus, but under stringent conditions that I'll get to in a few minutes. But before that, why is this scenario in play? One answer is that for many students, academic success and continuation depends in large part on their campus experience. This is particularly important for first time in college students. And many courses which can be offered remotely, in fact, are better educational experiences when on campus. We have to acknowledge that. And beyond educational concerns, we also need to recognize that we're an agency of the state of Florida and need to be responsive to the guidance from the state and local health departments and the Board of Governors. These second and third scenarios with some classes face-to-face -face, are the most complicated to plan and this work is underway. Most basically, we've not yet figured out all of the courses that would end up on campus in scenario three nor have we entirely determined how to handle all possible faculty concerns. We have to protect those who are most vulnerable who have, or who have vulnerable family members. These faculty and staff will need to work remotely for their health. What about other faculty preferences? This isn't totally finalized and I'd be grateful to hear your thoughts. We will need faculty to be flexible in how they offer their classes whether they're face-to-face -face or remote. Students will fall ill or be quarantined and will need to continue their coursework. That's complicated. The web courses team has developed some advice and we've also put together a teaching in fall task force, including faculty, to see what other advice or perhaps even requirements we should develop for our faculty. This planning is underway, but it's obviously not completed. But much of the planning, in fact, is well along. Classrooms, where there will be some face-to-face -face teaching, will be set up to respect physical distancing. So for example, a class of 25 students might be moved to a classroom that ordinarily seats 80, so that students can be physically separated. There are other flexible options, groups in the room at a time, for example, that we can discuss today, and the folks at web courses have thought hard about. The university will have a written policy about wearing masks and physical distancing in classrooms and in public areas. There will be extra cleaning. There will be supplies available, including no-touch dispensers of hand sanitizer. There will be 
clear instructions to students, faculty, and staff about expectations about what to do if someone is sick and a communication campaign about masks and physical distancing and hand washing. There will be enforcement, but I would like to hear your thoughts about that along with the other the issues that are on your mind. There'll be testing and tracing and surveillance. Other members of our panel can speak more directly about those plans as your questions come. The byword for teaching this fall is flexibility. We will have a plan that we will hope we can roll out, but we have to be prepared to change. We have to be prepared to offer high quality academic programs, whether face-to-face -face or remote or some hybrid, and we have to be prepared to shift from one potential scenario to another. That's my brief summary. And with that said, I'm uh, be grateful to hear questions from all of you. Manoj and Jen. Uh, thank you. First question comes from Ashley Squilante. Do we have a um, dates, any dates when guidelines will be presented for social distancing and minimum standards? Um, I don't know what the dates are soon. That's um, within a week or two is the best I can say. Great, thanks. And just a reminder to everybody to submit your questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We have a bunch coming in, so we're gonna try to get to all of them as quickly as we can. So question two from Jeannie Kirawas. Is UCF considering adjusting the academic calendar to end coursework before Thanksgiving as some other institutions have? Yeah, I personally think it's a good idea. We haven't had time to really raise the subject collectively. Um, I'll, I'll say why I think it's a good idea. We're lucky in that our academic calendar is much earlier than those of some traditional universities, say in the Northeast. We start early and we end early. And the way our calendar is set up, there's only about a week of classes after Thanksgiving. And I think people can plan to do that week differently. It would require all of the final exams to be done in some remote fashion. But frankly, that's probably something we should be planning for anyway. If we're gonna have a class set up, even if it is largely face-to-face -face, so that it can accommodate students who may fall ill or be quarantined. So not a decision, but I, I personally think we're likely to go there unless there's a, a good reason to, that is expressed why we shouldn't. The uh, next question comes from uh, Talat Rahman. Buzz Johnson, UCF UFF is conducting its own meetings on what measures should be in place for UCF to open to students in the fall. It would be a good idea to include a representative from UFF in the UCF task force that you have put in place. Faculty voices are important, as I know you agree. Yeah, we may have done that, Tala. I don't know for sure. We, um, Joe Harrington, the chair of the Faculty Senate, very helpfully pressed to make sure that we got faculty on all of the task forces. We had faculty on some, but not others, not out of you know malice, just out of moving really rapidly. Um, to get things planned. I think we have faculty on all of them now, or at least the majority of them now. Um, and I agree, it's necessary. All right, our next question is from Kelvin Thompson. How will high risk status of faculty intersect with general scenario planning for fall 2020? Yeah, um, I don't think we have formalized that as a university. Maureen may be able to explain more how we're doing it generally for all of us who are employed here. For me, this is one of the complicated things that I actually hope to hear, not just questions, but some thoughts today, because part of this is my mind easy. You know, we have faculty who have real risks um, beyond the norm in the, in, the, in the community as a whole people who are elderly, who have pre-existing health conditions, all the things that add to risk. And we've got to accommodate that. Um, where it starts to get complicated for me personally is that we also have different levels of sort of risk tolerance. Some of us are more timid and some of us are more bold. And it's, I'm not confident we'll be able to accommodate all of that. And th so that's the part of it actually that I find really quite challenging. And I'm gonna pause here all these first few questions I've shot at fast. Dr. Dykin or Maureen, would either of you want to comment on this? Well, I agree that it is a very complicated question. And 
I don't know that we've arrived at a complete answer because part of it's academic and how we're gonna deliver the academic courses to our students and part of it is medical. Um, and I don't know that we have a, a pat answer because we have to determine what scenario are we absolutely going for and what method are we going to deliver courses in and what faculty member is going to be doing what. And I think that plays into what the answer is, what faculty member can deliver what course and how big is the course and is that course going to be delivered online or in a mixed mode and all of that has to be taken into consideration. I don't think there's a one, there's one answer for every situation. And what I have told some of um, the management on the a and P and USPS side is that we have to look at each situation individually because there is no black or white answer um, because we have the same situation on the other side, on the professional side as well, in terms of employees coming back to campus, managers coming back to campus or employees. We have to look at each individual situation and that's really complex and really hard. We have certain family situations that might preclude us from requiring someone to be on campus if you're caring for someone who is in a high risk category if they're in their in your household and you can work remotely successfully or teach successfully remotely um, that plays into it there's no vaccine there's no cure and we really have to look at all of those situations individually almost dr dykin i i don't know if you have any comments well, uh, from a medical perspective, it is much easier to find who's vulnerable. The CDC clearly defines what vulnerable populations are, and we want to have added protections for those people and find innovative approaches that reduce their, their risk um, going, going forward. Um, so, you know, we are utilizing CDC guidelines, um, the American College of Health guidance, uh, and other um, uh, journals and publications to help us to discern what are the best practices for reduce, reducing risk to all of our community members. And this is part of that strategy. I will say that, you know, historically, the way we usually handle something like illness, or in this case, it's not necessarily illness, but, but risk, has been carried out well at the local level. You know, people are able to figure out who should do what. And, and I do have some hope that we can mostly handle this um, at the department level, but I also think we're gonna have to have some pretty well-established guidelines for the deans and chairs as to how to carry this out. And because that's the only way I understand how to do this equitably. And even then, there's gonna be special cases. And that's what Maureen's point was, where we're just going to have to say, okay, this doesn't fall in the norm, but we have to recognize this situation and deal with it. This is not, this is not the kind of answer I would give if plans in this respect were fully carried out. It's a statement that we're in the middle of figuring that part of it out. Before I go to the next question, I just have a follow-up on this last discussion for Dr. Dykin. Will I be told if a student or a colleague has tested positive for COVID-19, how many cases have there been? And is there a website like UF has where we will store this information? This is a moving target. We um, are completing recommendations from our contact tracing and testing committee. And uh, we are uh, planning to make significant changes to our approach here at UCF with regards to COVID. Um, but we need to keep in mind that um, these sorts of steps are primarily the responsibility of the public health department. Um, they have the authority and the responsibility uh, to do case management when there's a positive case. What we found so challenging uh, during the surge that occurred in March is they, they were overwhelmed and we had to step in for in the best interest of the university uh, to do de facto contact tracing. What we're looking to achieve going forward is a collaboration between UCF and the public health department. We're gonna establish a volunteer program for, for students and potentially others uh, to uh, work as contact tracers with epidemiologists uh, in Orange County Public Health. 
So we're going to significantly expand that resource. And it's also our plan to interface that resource with certain campus entities. With regards to sharing information, it's always on a need to know basis. Um, we need to protect the privacy of persons, but protect the public health. And there's a very standard approach that's used for contact tracing and informing entities um, of, of their risk. And, and we will maintain that balance uh, to, to talk to people that need to know that have had uh, an exposure, but not publicize the names of those persons uh, that have been diagnosed. And, and there's a well-defined methodology for that, and we'll follow that best practice. Thank you. The next question is from Cynthia Mejia. Uh, in scenarios two and three, who will determine which face-to-face -face come back, the university or the colleges? The colleges. Um, this We are close to charging the colleges to carry this out. And when I say the colleges, I mean the structure within the colleges, deans to chairs and faculty and programs. Um, they, the, we've already gotten from the colleges back in the early summer or late spring, a list of those courses and programs that they thought really absolutely had to be on campus, if at all possible. That's what I would call scenario two. Um, so for example, there are some clinical courses which require hands-on human beings to learn how to do something. And the people involved in those would um, argue strongly in favor of teaching those face-to-face in that case with considerably more elaborate PPE than maybe normal teaching. It's this next step, um, which we haven't quite carried out yet. We will seek to have a set of priorities for the colleges to, to use when they think about face-to-face -face classes. So it'll start with the ones I just mentioned. I think, and I, I think it's arguably correct, that we need to make certain that there's a good offering of the classes that freshmen FTIC students usually take. And the reason is that this is a particularly vulnerable group from an academic point of view. Um, their success in college depends a great deal on their experience on campus as they start their education. But coming from the other end, colleges, departments, faculty have already identified a set of classes which they know they can offer very well remotely. And so it's going to be going from both ends to the middle which will be the trick. I expect we'll end up planning in scenario three to have a maximum of maybe a quarter or 30% or so of our classes on campus. That switches our normal balance. We're usually something like 30% uh, online, fully developed, quality stamped online education and 70% um, purely face-to-face, -face. I think we'll probably reverse that even this, even in scenario three's planning, which I think is the, the, the most optimistic possibility for fall. And then I'm going to add to that, that in my own mind, one of the benefits of planning this way is that you know, we have to make a plan. We have to tell parents and students what we expect to be happening. People have to make decisions on leases, whether they're gonna start college or continue college, take time off or not. So they need to have a sense as soon as we can of how we're approaching it. And then they can look in the registration system after it's modified and see, are the courses I need face-to-face -face the way I want? Are the courses I need online the way I want? And make rational plans for fall but that said, then as August approaches, we will know better what the actual public health circumstances are at that time in Orange County, in Central Florida and Florida. And if it's necessary to adjust down, for example, from that number of face-to-face -face classes, I think we'll be able to do so without chaos, but with a, a degree of planning. A very quick follow-up for uh, Tom Cavanaugh. I know that there are some training courses planned in, in association with the way we're going to proceed. Would you comment briefly on that before we go to the next question? Yeah, there are, there are a number of different uh, professional development um, offerings that we are developing. Um, mostly are based on existing programs that we have, but uh, some of the existing programs just won't fit uh, in the in the time frame that we have, nor with the demand that we have. So we've adjusted some of those to prepare faculty to teach fully web-based or what we call W courses, as well as to teach um, 
some of these video-based uh, remote instruction. And, um, and we are also developing some guidelines and some training for faculty to teach in some of these uh, more flexible models that um, will combine uh, kind of socially distant face-to-face -face experiences with some remote instruction to allow students to have some face-to-face -face experience, yet also um, follow all the other guidelines that the university expects. So more information is coming on that, uh, hopefully very soon. We're very close. It's being, all of our communications are being reviewed right now. All right, we still have a number of people joining us. So just a reminder, the Q&A box is where you wanna look for questions that you wanna upvote. There's also a few questions that have been answered. So look at that answered tab. Our next question is from Kelly Aaron. Will faculty be required to wear a mask the entire time teaching face-to-face -face if students are six feet from the speaker or faculty. My class is two hours, 50 minutes, and I may be expected to teach this two times in one day. I want to keep my students safe as well as myself, but teaching six hours in one day while wearing a mask the entire time concerns me. Can this be addressed when making plans for face-to-face -face class? And there was also an additional um, question about this in regards to clear masks for students who might need to read lips. So that was a lot. If you need me to repeat anything, Mike. So I'm going to start and then hand this off to whoever has thoughts. Um, I think the short answer is yes to both questions, meaning our policy that's going to roll out as an official university policy is going to require all of us to wear masks when um, we're in public settings. Uh, inside buildings, inside classrooms, and I hear you. That's a it's a concern. If you're, it's it's hard enough to sit six or eight hours with a mask on, you know, at a desk and work. It's that much worse with the energy, activity, and speaking of a classroom. I I, I I don't don't doubt that for a minute. I I've seen some of the conversations about clear masks. The folks at um, Student Accessibility Services have been doing some research into their effectiveness, Dr. Dyke, sorry, their effectiveness as a aid for learning. Dr. Dykin's group has been thinking about, Dr. Dykin has been telling us what the public health officials have to say about masks and clear shields. So I'll pause Dr. Dykin. Yeah, you know, the, the basic principles of control of this epidemic are everyone wearing facial covering, uh, practicing good hand hygiene, and physical distancing. If we simply achieve those few principles, there will be containment. And, and it's fascinating um, that there can be containment with uh, facial coverings, even if the majority, uh, even if a fairly large number of persons don't wear facial coverings, that we do not want that. But facial coverings have a, a huge impact on the epidemic. Uh, you know, uh, with regards to wearing some sort of face shield, it's not going to provide adequate uh, control of uh, cough or sneezing or breathing uh, secretions. Um, so it, it's just not really doable. Uh, there could be other means for those persons that um, have uh, hearing impairment or other, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, processing issues uh, besides clear facial coverings, there has to be a, a, um, a, a genuine facial covering and we're going to publish what those standards are for facial coverings. Um, it just makes such a huge difference. So that has to be part of the plan. So the next question is actually related to what we just discussed, but it talks about enforcement. How will the mask policy uh, be enforced? Uh, what if a student insists on not wanting to wear it either in class or in office hours? Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to hear your thoughts on this too, but I will say that the policy that we're going to promulgate requiring the wearing of masks and requiring of social distances in classrooms and the like um, has an enforcement statement in it. So in, in general, the notion right now is that we use our ordinary disciplinary tools. You know, it's, it's relatively easy with an employee. If you tell me where you wear a mask and I say I don't want to, you can say to me, if you wish to continue your employment, you're going to wear a mask. 
And if I refuse to do it, there's a disciplinary process um, as there always is. There's a disciplinary process on the student side as well. How, so that's the first statement. It's not a voluntary matter. We are, I'm gonna pause for a second because Jana has thought some about this with some people, but I, part of the, so let me back up and say, part of the success in this is culture and social norming. You know, think about the tobacco free campus campaign. Those of you who are here, it was fairly startling to me to watch over the course of a fairly short time for this campus to decide that we would prohibit tobacco on campus. And we did it essentially by all agreeing that we would no longer allow um, tobacco on campus. There was relatively infor little enforcement necessary in that case. Um, and most of us didn't figure out how to deal with it if we saw somebody smoking outside our building door or something like that. We didn't need to. In this case, I think we're going to need to have good advice for faculty. I don't think that's rolled out yet, but, but the but part of the statement I want to say is it's actually not a choice. And that's the most important thing the faculty member needs to know. What do you do if a student is in your class who you know, refuses to sit down and is disruptive? That's not acceptable. There's a disciplinary process. Um, and, I, and I would put this in that category. I realize that nationally, this is a political issue and all of that. That's not how we're approaching this on campus. We hope we can develop a culture where people recognize this, you know, this is Knights taking care of Knights. You may feel safe, but it's your job to help take care of others. With all that said, um, enforcement, and then especially guidance to faculty on how to handle this if, if it's in their own classroom, I think is really important. I know that Maureen and Jan have thought about this, so let me now pause. I'll just add that um, there is a group of faculty, um, we have called ourselves the Teaching in the Fall Task Force Subcommittee. And this is one of the topics that we're we'll talking about is how to provide the best guidance for faculty in some of these different scenarios and certainly enforcing um, students wearing masks will be one of them. And on the employee side, we will just use our normal disciplinary process that we already have. And I know that Mary Beth Ehas, Dr. Ehas on the student side, they will on the, just use the, the student conduct policy and they're working through that. And that's why the policy isn't finalized as we're working through not only the policy, but the procedure for what will happen for enforcement. But the, what we're talking about is just using our normal processes in terms of discipline, both on the employee side and the student side as well. But it needs to become part of the culture, as Dr. Johnson said, um, because of the public health issues, as well as it just has to be a part of the culture. And we're saying that you need to wear the masks, face, facial coverings inside unless you're in your own private office by yourself. And we're highly recommending that you wear your mask outside as well, but we can't enforce it outside, but we highly recommend it. That last question came from Maria Kapursi. We thank her for that. And I just want to say that the Office of Research I know has a policy of a calling number in case you observe something that you're not comfortable with. Uh, which is the integrity line. I believe that's uh, the way the research labs are uh, working. I just wanted to make that comment. Jen. Great, this, uh, this question is good for me to ask because it's about messaging and communication. So from Wayne Bowen, could we use a phrase other than return to work in communications? For many faculty and staff, the last two and a half months have been harder with more work because it has been remote. This wording implies that we have not been at work when I'm sure that was not the intent. Amen. Uh, you, are, you are not the first to make this point. Um, and I'm pretty sure that language is being changed everywhere it exists. It was a convenient shorthand but by some group, but I, I complained about it too. I first complained about it in the, in the teaching category. It's like, we're not returning to teaching. You know, this, this hasn't stopped. It's been going full speed and it's been hard. So now it says return to on-campus teaching or something like that um, on the website. But I agree. I just agree. I think we all do. I would say that as well. And I've gotten feedback 
to and for many people they've been working harder than ever and i'm referring it as repopulate the campus so but i would wholeheartedly agree with that people are working really really hard to support our students our faculty and we just want um, to be recognized for that so thank you for saying that so there are a couple of questions uh in the queue, uh, both related to uh, multiple people in enclosed spaces and Dr. Dyke, and this uh, talks about airflow uh, and airborne transmission. Let me read this. The first one is from Dr. West, Dr. Lawrence West. My research has revealed that when multiple people are in an enclosed space over time, a key determinant of infection risk is the airflow, whether it is filtered, replaced from the outside, static, or flowing across multiple people. Have rooms, have rooms been evaluated for air quality? And if I may, the, there's a related question from Anna Jones. How much is airborne transmission being taken into account in these planning measures, given that we're seeing more and more studies suggesting that people spending time talking in enclosed spaces is a particularly dangerous scenario for the spread of the virus? Those are great, great questions, um, Manoj, and, and to, um, and, you know, our, our um, uh, listeners. Uh, and the science is evolving with regards to COVID and uh, risk of air, airborne uh, spread. Um, a lot of the circumstances that we've heard about involve uh, uh, super spreader uh, instances, for example, in environments where masks were not worn, okay? Uh, so, um, you know, the events such as the one that occurred with the choir in Washington State uh, it involved a super spreader event um, in, in that church uh, where they were practicing uh, and many of the persons were exposed and infected with COVID. Um, that was without masks um, and also, um, you know, a, a special type of use of voice with the singing in a, in a robust environment with singing. Um, so masks do, do make a difference. Um, with regards to ventilation, we are working with our facilities experts uh, and have done assessments on best practices for air control within our environments. Um, and I, I'm not an expert in that regard. Um, and perhaps, um, Missy, if, if you could share some insight into that, if, if, if you're aware of any detail. Uh, but though there are steps taking place to assess um, what are the best standards for airflow uh, within our classrooms and other spaces on, on the university campus. That might be Duane as well. Sure, and I'm actually, um, the HVAC systems in these buildings are very complex. Um, we're looking at um, higher standard and higher quality filters, like UV filters. Um, and I'm gonna let Duane talk more about who knows the the mechanics of the building and the ventilation system. Yes, so uh, I have my team's been working with ASHRAE, and we actually have one of the team members that's on uh, one of the CDC talk boards for it. And we've been putting together a list of what is in each building, what we're doing for every building, and um, kind of asking I've been looking through the questions here what air exchanges we have in what building. and. These are all things that were some of the frequently asked questions that was underneath the provost direction. So we planned on working with um, the communications and marketing team today to try to get them posted by the end of the day, a bunch of questions uh, with answers about all these different topics. I can tell you that the biggest thing that we're trying to do uh, is to install UVC lighting inside the um, filtration system and all the air handlers. That will help us uh, mitigate the risk in these um, high density areas, which, which would be classrooms and office areas. Uh, we have uh, one building already um, uh, tentatively scheduled in the next few weeks, and we have many, many more uh, before the fall classes. Now, research buildings, uh, back to the, one of the questions that was here is most of those in the lab areas are 100% outside air. Um, for the other buildings, like Misty had mentioned, Besides UVC is trying to see what we can do to increase uh, the MERV ratings and to basically put a better filter in. Um, we know that our basic ASHRAE standard is two air exchanges an hour. 
That's our basic and all of our buildings on campus are designed to ASHRAE standards. So that's, if that provides uh, uh, any, any, you know, um, means of letting us know that we're building high performance buildings and we're, we're doing our hardest to try to mitigate the risk. We're also just to add to this, we're, we're looking at different cleaning procedures for classrooms and offices. And we're working underneath the provost and the task force directions. And those questions and answers will come out too soon. Great. This is also a good reminder for us faculty of all of the pieces of campus that are constantly working, sometimes behind the scenes, right, before uh, we even think about going into our classrooms. So I hope we can remember all of that, that work that's going into this. This is a, a follow up. Um, Bruce Jan says the six foot rule is meant for outdoor contact. HVAC circulates everything in a room in the space of an hour or so. I don't see how it could work. So his question is, is it possible at all to have hour long classes even in larger rooms and with fewer people? I, I think that's what we're talking about. Let me make sure I, Bruce, Bruce, this is what we're planning. The, it's to have um, smaller groups of people in larger classrooms. So, you know, we've had a task force COVID capacity task force, looking at all of our 300 classrooms and some other possibilities, asking with spacing between students, at least six feet, what would be the new capacity of this room? So a lecture hall of 300 maybe could, could sit 80. I made that number up. Uh, a room that would normally hold 80 could sit 25. I made that number up. But they've been making these calculations. And the next step, the one that I described as complicated is first identifying which classes should continue to be on campus in the fall schedule, moving the groups that are small, like 25, into rooms intended to hold like 80. Again, making those particular numbers up for just this reason. There are other more flexible options and I have no objection to flexibility. It could be that you want to keep your class of 80 in the room that holds 80, but you're just going to have 25 of them come in at a time. You know, 25, the numbers aren't working, but don't worry about it. A third Monday, a third Wednesday, a third Friday, for example, would be another way to have fewer people in a larger space. Um, Tom Cavanaugh's group has come up with a set of ideas on flexible options that faculty may be interested in. Faculty may have other ideas of their own as well. Tom, was there anything you wanted to add there? Just to underscore what I said earlier, that um, that we are we're working on uh, getting that information out as quickly as possible. We're kind of circulating it through the colleges right now. We've asked a number of people to review what we've said to make sure it's clear. So hopefully, in the very near future, a lot more details around some of those flexible options, as well as the training associated with them, will be released. And I'd also like to add that the Teaching in the Fall Task Force Subcommittee is also thinking through potential areas we haven't thought of and brainstorming about um, challenges, solutions, innovations, and new ideas for that as well. Great. All right. The next question is from John Rabel. Will access to campus be restricted for students? For example, students that do not have face-to-face -face classes won't be allowed on campus. No, I don't think so. Um, and, and that's a that touches on something bigger than the question about campus and one of the sort of community concerns. Um, so first, let me say that students need to use study spaces, students need to use the library. The library, the tech center, and those um, places like that, including the union, are working together in yet another task force, thinking about how to reopen those spaces safely for student use. Students need those spaces, whether they're taking face-to-face -face classes or not. One of the many burdens that happened this spring and it's continued this summer for students is, is the digital divide, right? We have some students who are in circumstances like me here at home with a pretty solid internet connection and a desktop computer that works. We've got others really struggling with um, remote instruction because of the, the technology or infrastructure that's available to them. Students need access to those things on campus. In addition, we're a public entity with no walls and no gate. And the reason we are able sometimes to shut our campus down is because of emergency orders or declarations by Orange County. We closed our campus 
when Orange County said, um, when Orange County declared the stay at home order, for example, we, uh, we actually can't stop members of the public from coming onto campus when, um, when there's not such an emergency kind of order in place. So that's a different part of the statement. But then the reason this is part of this bigger community concern is we're, we're not, you know, we're not a, a little college town with a little secluded campus 300 miles from the nearest big town or city. Um, our students and our faculty and our staff are part of the whole Orange County community. And so the health plans that Dr. Dykin keeps referring to are totally integrated with the county because we have no other way to do this. We, we could do the, the most brilliant job in the world on our campus. Um, and the fact that we have many, many students in a community of two and a half million people would perhaps play a big role in the, in the eventual health. So this is a lengthy answer, a little bit of why, but the answer is no, we won't try to prohibit students. What, I, what I'm most concerned about therefore is, is, is what amounts to a public health communication campaign. Most of you in this, in this um, town hall today probably recognize the need to maintain social distancing. You try to do so in your own lives. You wear your masks. Um, I hope so. Um, we need our students to understand that, that it's for the, the health of the good, it's for the good of the whole, it's for the health of all of us. It's not just me deciding whether I want to take care of myself or not, it's me helping with the whole community. So I say all of that because we couldn't control students having a party in an off-campus apartment, whether or not we have on-campus on classes. We cannot control that behavior except by social norming and communication and trying to help people understand how to take care of us all. Anyway, I'm, I'll shut up about that, but it's, a, it's actually getting onto something that I think is really complicated. Let me pause again. Others of you on the panel who thought about this, any, any comments in this direction? I'd like to expand a little bit uh, upon your discussion, Provost Johnson, and to let the listeners know that we're creating a complex matrix of protections for our community. We're all in this together and we need to do our best. We need to wear our facial coverings and practice hand hygiene and maintain physical distancing. And we're looking at room ventilation, but we're also creatively looking for solutions for the campus as a whole, for the population. And I wanna share with you a few other things that, that we're, 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 we're planning on. Uh, one is that testing is an important part of uh, our campaign. And you may know that we have drive-through testing for uh, the virus available in Garage A and on the main campus. Um, and this testing is covered by insurance and it's free to uninsured persons. Um, and we've, we've had a wonderful collaborative um, relationship with the lab that's doing this ten testing, Aventus Bio Labs, and we plan to continue with that. Part of that relationship is going to be targeted testing of our campus. We're looking to test all uh, incoming uh, students that are going to reside on campus housing, also all athletes, uh, because they're, they have a special niche where the risk to ourselves and themselves may be, be higher. We're also exploring with a, a really brilliant team of uh, UCF professors and, and uh, other staff, um, an, an application, um, an app uh, that uh, will be uh, utilized with all faculty, staff, and students uh, to screen for COVID uh, symptoms or exposure and to connect those persons uh, with, with testing. Um, so yet another uh, layer. We plan to do other forms of uh, surveillance uh, with potential antibody uh, screens of the population to better understand what, what is the state of UCF with regards to immunity or disease. Uh, one of the earlier questions asked about uh, how many infections have occurred at UCF. And we, we know that number approximately, it's in the, the low 20s to the best of our knowledge, but we're gonna expand um, our, the validity of our data with our relationship with Orange County 
and of interest is we'd like to post um, this data to the campus. How many new cases have there, there been? Uh, what is the rate of influenza-like illness that's occurring within our, our student health center? Um, and uh, potentially antibody surveillance studies. We want to be very transparent. We're all in this together um, and create a dashboard, maybe similar to what the Florida Department of Health is, is doing. So we're, we're weaving together a system that best protects the campus. We're all in this together. And it's, it's not just the, the classroom design that's important, but these other factors are very important too. Dr. Dyke, and you mentioned two special groups or populations that you, uh, you will be testing. Um, how about people that will be returning to the Central Florida area from other areas that are uh, potentially uh, hot zones? You know, I listed the residence hall uh, group uh, because um, certainly some of those persons will be from uh, areas of higher prevalence like Dade and Broward counties, for example. Um, and they also have um, um, a, a significant presence on campus and potential spread to others. So thinking about containment of outbreak, it's a very logical group. Um, with regards to testing others, um, there, there may be challenges to, to be quite frank with you, Manoj. Uh, if you think about our student population, um, that's uh, maybe up to a third of our students could be from Broward or Dade counties, for example, and testing all of those may be challenging. However, we may not be doing uh, a, a, a test for the virus, a nasal swab, but we will be doing symptom screens on everybody. And symptom screens are a more valid uh, screen in, in a lot of uh, regards to temperature screens. Uh, symptom screens and connecting people with services. So we're using innovation to uh, identify those persons and others and connect them with testing. And then we'll use our contact tracing group to, to rapidly uh, contain any uh, potential um, outbreak that, that, that could occur. So we, we want to put all these pieces together. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Eduardo Mucciolo. What are the plans for cases when instructors or students do not feel comfortable going into the classroom? Uh, say 10 students want to be in class, but the other 10 uh, do not want to for fear of getting sick. Yeah, I, I guess that's a two part issue, Eduardo. The first is we, we have a preliminary, what ordinarily would be our final fall schedule that students are registering for. That's gonna be modified as a consequence of planning for scenario three. So students will know before the semester starts whether it's a, a class with some campus presence or not. And those who are uncomfortable before the semester starts will have a good number of options available for remote instruction, depending on the students Time, uh, time in their educational career and their major, that might be a satisfactory fall, for example, for students who wish to be remote. Um, for others, it may limit what's available to them in their progression to degree. Um, so that, that decision should be made by students before the semester begins. But then I'm, I'm gonna answer your question about students differently in the middle of the semester. A lot of faculty use attendance policies in face-to-face -face classes for extremely good reasons. Um, this isn't the semester for that. Just as we ask people in the spring to relax their attendance policies, I think we're gonna to have to really press for faculty not to have harsh attendance policies this fall. If a student feels bad, I, and I wake up in my, I think maybe I'm coming down with something, we don't want them going to class for fear of losing some points towards their grade. Gianna's committee, I think, will try to help come up with stronger either recommendations or even requirements um, for classes this fall. And part of the need for this fall is to have a flexible approach in the classroom so that even if it is a face-to-face -face class or partially face-to-face -face class, you've got an approach which allows students who become ill or become quarantined 
or it might apply to those who become fearful to be able to progress in the class remotely. That's complicated. That's what Tom's group is working on ferociously hard and Jana's um, task force will be looking for more advice. So for faculty, it's a two-part answer again. The first is, as we seek to reschedule fall, to reset our fall registration system, I hope we will answer most of these questions. Um, so I'll go back to one of the earlier questions I was asked. We're certain that faculty with risk factors, with, with, with um, higher risk than others, shouldn't be in face-to-face -face classes. We should do what we can to give them assignments which keep them isolated and protected. We may not be able to do this with everybody who's uncomfortable. And there is a difference between being at escalated risk and having um, less comfort with being on campus. I don't know yet how that will play out. I don't, I don't know that we can totally free this, throw this open to faculty preference without causing um, chaos and, and a pretty deep inequity. And let me just point out how some of this inequity would work. Pretend you're the tenure earning faculty member who's uncomfortable. Well, you, you don't maybe get to be the one who feels that you, you have the power to press on this. I am very dismayed when tenure earning faculty members or our non tenure earning faculty feel less empowered to speak their minds than their tenured colleagues. I really quite thoroughly dislike that. And I don't like depart department cultures which facilitate that. But I can't pretend that we don't have people who feel less able to speak out about their own concerns. So I think it's uh, that, that thing about not being comfortable is not the same thing. That's what I'm really trying to say as being at risk. And we will have to work our way through that. And I don't have glib answers on how we will work our way through it. Can I add just one, one comment on that? Um, some of the flexible options that we are working on, as Provost Johnson alluded, uh, will include the use of video within the classroom, whether it's Panopto, our existing lecture capture tool, or Zoom like we're using now, so that those students who might not be in class on any given day can continue to progress in, in the course without being uh, penalized or missing materials. And, and we expect that at various points in the semester, I assume that we might see various students having to leave class and potentially self-isolate for a couple of weeks should they be exposed to, to somebody um, who has the illness or suspects that they have the illness. And, and we wouldn't want those students to miss two weeks of instruction or if the faculty member needs to, to step out for any reason. So some of these flexible uh, strategies will use video very extensively. And some of the instruction that we, we will provide, some of the professional development for faculty will include how to, how to take advantage of that, both from a technical standpoint, but with some pedagogical practice issues. Like for example, if you are going to use that sort of strategy, you, you can't use the whiteboard in the room because it won't be captured on video, but instead you, you probably will have to use the document camera. And it's just you know minor adjustments to your practice. But other than that, um, the idea is that you shouldn't have to make major changes to what you are doing, but the technology will help to compensate for some of these various flexible scenarios we're, we're probably going to face. And I'll add to that, that the Faculty Center for Teaching and Learning is having a teaching and learning day in June to talk about how you might think about pedagogical changes using technology as well. And they're gonna be focusing some of their development efforts on those areas as well to complement what Tom Steve is doing. Great, for everybody joining us on the Zoom platform, just a reminder, the Q&A section is where you wanna post your questions, look in the answer tab for a few that have been addressed, and we are prioritizing those that are getting upvoted, so make sure to do that. We also know a lot of resources have been mentioned, a lot of websites and working groups, so uh, we'll make sure to remind you of those at the end uh, of the town hall as well. So the next question is from Heather Keithley. How does the university intend to ensure proper social distancing and force other policies for the common areas like bathrooms, elevators, hallways, shops, cafe, et cetera? Maureen or Misty or Dwayne, I think that might fall in your camps. We do have a sign campaign and Dwayne's staff has been installing signs all over campus. They're already up in many areas. Um, there will be more signs that are going to be posted and there will be 
signage placed in hallways and bathrooms, other places. A lot of those signs have been ordered. They're going to be in the process of being put up, the ones that haven't already. There's going to be increased cleaning as well, and I'll let Duane or Misty address that. Um, but again, a lot of it is the social norming of, of all of these things being followed. We have developed training that all employees will be required to take before they come back to campus. That is just going live today. And any of the employees who have already been notified that they may come back to campus starting on Monday have received an email to be able to register for that training through web courses and they have to take that training before they can come back to campus. Now, there are people who've already been on campus and haven't stopped coming to campus. And um, researchers, for example, have already been invited back to campus and they've already taken training. And certainly a lot of the facilities employees have been on campus and those individuals will uh, be contacted separately about if they need to do anything different. So, um, and as we have talked about earlier, the enforcement of some of these new requirements will be handled uh, by reporting to the integrity line or talking to your supervisor. We, in the training, we talk about three different ways to report individuals who are not following the requirements. So we give you options. You don't have to jump immediately to the integrity line, for example. Um, but I think I'll turn it over to Misty and or Dwayne to talk about some of the measures that are being taken to instruct people appropriately for how to maneuver campus. Sure, so um, Dwayne and his team have worked up um, heightened cleaning protocol, more frequent, especially in the common areas, the bathrooms, um, a deep cleaning once a day and then two other times per day throughout the, the normal uh, work day. All the bathrooms will be cleaned, restocked with all necessary supplies, wiped down all the touch surfaces. In addition, his team's working diligently to install um, as many touchless features as we can before um, the population starts to grow on campus again. This means the touchless faucets or the touchless toilets door handles installing either the step and pulls or in some places the um, motion detected uh, wave of your hand that opens the door so um, a lot of thought into planning for um, what we can do in these common spaces that everybody's going to be uh, using as we start to repopulate campus uh, Dwayne, did you have anything else you'd like to add um, I'll just add a few things. I mean, you and Maureen did an excellent job on that. Yeah, we've, of course, we've never left the campus. We've been here um, basically through the whole thing. The staff has just, um, we're, we're just returning in large chunks right now to start putting in uh, all these features. We also, as you can imagine, have um, significantly increased our housekeeping staff and we're adding a lot more people to the teams and populating the buildings um, more than we ever have in the past. And we're starting with the research right now. We're learning a lot with the researchers that have just recently come back and how we're taking care of them and how we're cleaning. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a task and it's a, I will also add in there, it's a challenge um, right now to get some of the supplies. Uh, luckily it looks like uh, we will have everything um, ramped up. Uh, we have enough right now to go for what we have but for the fall semester, we should have everything that we need in stock, including um, sanitizing wipes that we'll be installing in classrooms and uh, those high density areas. So that even in between the cleanings, if, if students, faculty or staff need additional cleaning, um, they'll have those sanitizing wipes available to wipe down surfaces and to, to do those types of things. The restrooms and stuff like Misty had mentioned, uh, we're definitely doing a lot more cleaning than we ever have. And we're trying to go to as many touchless features as we can, including even looking at elevator controls that, um, you know, that on, another piece that has a lot of touching going on. And if we can put in a touchless feature of that, because there is, th those are available now. So we're looking at those. And our first one that we're looking at trying to install some type of uh, kit to is the library. So uh, we'll continue to work with 
the faculty uh, on changes and we'll update those before even the fall semester starts. Two other things I'd like to say is that we're also working with the management in the research park and all of the same cleaning protocols that are being done on main campus and our other campuses will also take place in the research park in cooperation with the research park management. So that's important. And then number two is that the phased repopulation of campus will allow for lessons learned in terms of, do we have to change anything before you know, classes start in the fall? And I think the key to that is what Provost Johnson said earlier, flexibility. We will you know, remain diligent in terms of, do we need to change things? Do we need to pivot? Do we need to be flexible? And does Duane's staff need to do anything different? Does my staff need to do anything different? How do we need to support the return to population of campus in a different way? So the next two questions are uh, related uh, and I will read them. They're both related to coordinating with the local school districts. Uh, Deborah Knox asks, has there been any coordination with the local school district and what the school districts intend for their students? This may impact parents' ability to return to campus daily if childcare becomes an issue. UCF is a large employer in the area and many faculty and staff will be affected by these decisions for our children. And Megan Sherrod asks a similar question. Local K through 12 school districts are offering the choice for virtual school versus F2F uh, face-to-face on-site elementary, middle, and high school instruction. Many of the county deadlines to opt in to virtual school for the entire 2020-2021 school year are in July. Faculty, staff, and student caregivers for K through 12 children may need to make a decision about the entire school year before final decisions for fall and spring at UCF are communicated. How should faculty, staff, and student caregivers of young children proceed if they need to go into uh, or opt into virtual school and need to remain home for 2020, 2021 to facilitate this? Those are super questions. Um, so I think we have to announce our plan for the fall semester um, to parents and students fairly soon so they can make rational plans. That means we'll all know what our plans are. I keep speaking in terms of scenario and contingency planning because we'll go on a path, but that may, path may have to change. Um, nonetheless, I think you will hear from us what we think is happening, what, what our intended fall schedule is, assuming we don't have to pivot because of growing health problems locally. You will know that in advance of any of the deadlines I just heard. Um, the, the challenges I had had thinking about the public schools is that I think they can, they may be able to make up their minds later than we can. That is to say, make a final declaration sooner to the start of the fall semester. Um, but we have, you know, we need to announce it to our community fairly soon. That's always been the case. Now the Board of Governors requiring us to have a plan documented, presented, and approved by um, June. So you will know our plan at least before that July date. And I hope that helps. Maureen, this is a all employee problem and I know you've been thinking. Yes, of right, and I would agree with you. We need to let people know because they do, this is a very real issue for so many of our faculty and staff. Yeah, I'm just gonna say that I mean, my own take on this is that we have to understand that this is a, it's always complicated to have kids at home. It's always complicated to have family members who are ill or vulnerable at home. And we, and under normal circumstances, we, we recognize that and maybe make a degree of accommodation for it. But it's really important right now. Um, I, I just, I, don't, I can't imagine how you can assume somebody can have, for example, school age or younger children at home all the time now, or somebody they have to care for and there's no opportunity for them to go anywhere else during the week and assume that they can have a work life that's normal compared to normal times. We're in a real crisis and I hope everybody does understand that. You know, it's a, 
you know, I started this talking about compassion and I really believe it. It's, it's less of a time to be, um, I don't know what, determined and forward driving about life and more of a time to try to help people uh, succeed, you know, hold them, hold them up, hold one another up, and do what we can to help. I, and some of the people that I work with every day are, are at home, you know, with young children and it makes me laugh when we have a Zoom meeting and some kid won't stop hollering, um, but it doesn't make them laugh, right? It's just, it's a pain for them, it's a hassle. I'm fortunate to be at a later point in my life from that point of view, less so from the risk factor point of view. Anyway, I'll just stop there and say, yeah, these are real concerns. And it's both, it's both scheduling people's work lives, being flexible, allowing people, staff in particular to work remotely, trying to help our faculty with the greatest needs, be the ones who have the opportunities to work remotely. But then, you know, really understanding that we all have circumstances and trying to be compassionate about it. Thanks, Mike. I love that reminder about compassion. I think it's a moment for community care, right? Um, the next question is shifting a little bit to um, parking leave. So if, from Marie, if students, faculty, and staff are not physically present in classrooms, office spaces, et cetera, will the parking permit fees be adjusted to reflect the reduced time on campus? And a follow-up says, when will we receive refunds for our 2019-2020 current mandatory parking permit fees? It's, you know, it's, I will say, and Misty may have more to say, I will say, we acknowledge the issue. It hasn't risen to be a priority for me because there's been so much we've had to get done that's taking so much time to plan that's on the table as something to figure out. Misty, do you have more complete thoughts than I have? Well, no, I, I think that's a, a good point. Um, it's, it's under consideration. We've clearly um, been talking about that. It's come up. Um, the idea of the, um, the fees that parking generates though, um, they go towards the, the long-term facilities that are on campus that are going to remain. So the, the garages that are on campus and, and the debt that goes along with them um, that doesn't go away for this temporary period that we're in, as well as uh, some of the, the funding that's generated through parking goes to other areas and supports other areas on campus. So all of these considerations are going into um, the university's final decision on what to do about um, these parking permits. The uh, next question comes uh, also from Talat Rahman. Uh, we realize that budget cuts are imminent but it is also of utmost importance that we not lay off any UCF employees. Collectively, we can work together to make that happen at UCF. As you go through uh, prioritizing UCF's needs to make budget cuts, what measures would you be taking to ensure that faculty are in the loop and the process is transparent? Yeah, this is, this is a good and complicated question. The first statement is that we fear reductions in revenues budget from the state, loss of student enrollment, but we don't know what's going to happen. The state is, um, has a degree of optimism in the, in the government, in the legislature, in the governor's office about the consequences of the CARES Act, about the fact that the state has reserves, I think maybe hopes about additional federal hope for states. Um, and we, we're not planning budget cuts, right? I, I think, and, and I will just tell you, in this, pro, this position that I've inherited, in some ways that, that makes me a bit anxious because if we're going to be suffering a shortfall of revenue, which I personally think is likely, the sooner and clearer we seek to make our plans, the better. But um, we, are, we are not yet at that point. So there's not some, secret process going on. The closest I'm aware of is that I asked the deans to think about what they would do in the face of budget cuts that range from modest 
to truly frightening. And the reason was to start the thinking. And I'm just going to distinguish thinking from planning, OK? Um, there aren't any plans, but I do think we have to think about it. Now, we, we so faculty involvement is, a, is the, the other half of that question. And I think the way this is going to work, and I, and I can't tell you for certain, because we have a new president and a new circumstance with coronavirus and potential budget cuts. I suspect that what we will have is a version of a university budget committee for the coming year to help us make those decisions. Everything that committee does will be recommendations in the end to the president, not decisions. And that, that group will have faculty representation on it. That's my prediction as to the path we're on. At the same time, you may know that we've been working on an entirely new approach to budgeting for the university. Um, it's, it's got a steering committee, it's got a committee of people working on it, which includes faculty representation. This new model, which I quite like because of its transparency, because of its clarity about how we spend money, won't actually be in effect, wouldn't even be in effect in normal times for more than a year from now. So while that model continues to be developed, we have to have another process in the coming year. And, and I just told you what I think that process will be, but it'll be the president's call. Right, as we're nearing the end of our town hall here today, we have a, a question going back to some earlier uh, concerns from Steve Bale. Uh, the statement is, I don't think that personal belief or boldness should be a factor. Public health is a community issue. Don't we need to act in ways that protect everyone? Isn't it an error in US and CDC policy to individualize choices like wearing a mask? Yeah, we're not individualizing those choices at all. It's gonna be university requirement. When I spoke about boldness, it was in a different context. It has to do with what freedom what independent autonomy should each of us have about our workplace? And that's a more complicated question. I'm certain that we need to protect those who are highest, who are at highest risk. I'm less happy about a notion that um, individual choice should decide who else, for example, might teach remotely. And the reason I've already mentioned, it's both chaos that can develop, but also the, the incredible inequities that result from differential power or differential perceived power or different willingness to push. So I'm worried, I'm worried about how that will play out. My hope is that we're going to have such a significant fraction of our teaching that's the, that is remote, that on the faculty side, this will play out more or less in alignment with faculty choices in addition to um, definitely protecting those who are at higher risk. But I, I, I can't say today that I'm confident how that will play out. That's why you heard this sort of answer from me. But you got to wear your mask. You're not going to have any choice about wearing your mask. And I'm not, look at my not smiling. If faculty don't wear their masks, we will move towards disciplinary proceedings. Disciplinary proceedings can end in all kinds of terrible things, including termination. You'd have to be um, really stubborn to risk your job or your continuation as a college student at your university for your determination not to wear a mask. I'm, let me just be clear about that. These policies are real. They're not here yet. They will be real. One of the things about masks is we are going to be providing every student and every employee with a UCF cloth reusable mask. Those have been ordered. They're going to be here, I think, June 8th, if I'm not mistaken, and they will be distributed. And there's going to be a distribution plan that hasn't been completely worked out yet, but everyone will be provided with one reusable, washable mask. And then there will also be disposable masks that will be provided for visitors as well, and there will be, those will be distributed as well. And you know, before, I know we're about to wrap up, but this comment about masks just reminds me of a certain point. We have a history in this country of differential enforcement of all kinds of laws and policies. And um, 
differential levels of concerns by community on what it means to be tra traced and tracked. And I think we have to be really attentive to that. You know, it's really, it's a, it's a terrible thing when we see a jogger shot and killed because he's African-American. I personally am worried about the response to mask wearing of different communities, just like there's a digital divide. There's a divide in social consequences of behavior. Um, I'm middle-aged, I'm white, I'm going bald. Generally speaking, when I misbehave, the consequences for me are not as great as they can be for others. And I honestly think as a university, we're gonna to have to be more explicit about this in our conversations with one another about masks and enforcement of social distancing and all of that, because this has to be done equitably and with a recognition that we're coming to this from different positions. So, you know, what I described as a stubborn refusal for one person might be based on a whole different life experience for another. We're going to have to understand that. But, but the point of that question is that the public health considerations have to come first. And I, I, I think all of us on this panel are in total agreement that that is how we have to organize our, our, our work and teaching lives this fall. We are nearing the end of this uh, forum. I do have Two quick uh, comments. One is a comment uh, for Maureen. If you just want to tell the staff about an upcoming forum that you will be having a town hall. Thank you, Naj. Yes, yeah, so we will be hosting, I will be hosting a forum for USPS and AMP staff on Tuesday. And that will be from 1030 to 12. Many of the same individuals that are on this panel will be participating in that as well. There will be an announcement and information about that going out, I believe, today. So look for that. And um, we'll be certainly answering questions as well, but it will be more focused on the USPS and A&P employee group. And I have a personal question for Provost Johnson. Uh, there's a trend, of course, nationwide to stop the semester, potentially Thanksgiving, and not have people go and come back. Have we discussed that, or is that on our horizon? I think it's likely, but it hasn't been really very well discussed or decided. I think for us, it's not as big a deal as it is for some other universities because of the nature of our academic calendar this fall. All right, well, that concludes our time for questions. I am sorry we did not get to every question. The provost's office will capture these questions and make every effort to answer these in a follow-up communication. So uh, Interim Provost Johnson, any final comments before we conclude? Sure, let me thank you all for joining us today and especially thank Manoj and Jennifer for, for moderating this. And let me thank the panelists for taking part. To our faculty in particular who have joined us today, please feel free to reach out to me or to any of the panelists if you've got additional thoughts or questions. We will continue to provide the latest information as it becomes available for fall teaching and on-campus work. And as we move closer to fall, please know that we will need to make some decisions centrally. But I strongly believe that the faculty's creativity and flexibility and dedication in the classroom is what gives the best education to our students. We will try as hard as possible to stay out of that piece of your autonomy. Please stay healthy. Thank you all for joining us. Hello, Johnson. Uh, Dr. Ehaus has asked me to remind everyone that there will also be a student forum on June 4th from 2.30 to 4, and information on that will be forthcoming. She's going to be sending out a communication so that the student population will be able to hear information and ask questions as well. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, thank you, Maureen. So there is a upcoming uh, staff as well as a student town hall uh, that should be on our radar. This, this concludes the Provost Fall Teaching Town Hall Forum. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you all.